hymn number 446, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Hymn number 446.
tackle it with that. <laughs> no. no, okay. No, not quite. All right. I have just text anxiety. I can do pretty good at home, but test anxiety here. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> test anxiety. Here you go. They say, you got to be careful what you do because when life is over with, there will be a test. <laughs> all right. Well, let's sing our offertory hymn this morning. Jesus is all the world to me. Hymn number 475. Let's stand together. As we sing all four verses. Hymn number 475.
turned out since one of my little pieces of paper went flying earlier. Since that's on the floor, Mac will now come and preach for us. <laughs> so you say we might get out a little early today? <laughs> okay, Matthew chapter 8 is what we're going to look at. That's what Mac's going to preach on this morning. Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13 is what we're going to be looking at. Now, in this story that we're about to read, a Roman centurion came and asked Jesus to come and heal his servant. Now, depending upon which particular gospel you read this story from, they tell a few little different details about it. In fact, in one version of the story, Matthew doesn't really cover in much detail. The centurion felt unworthy to even approach Jesus. He stopped a few feet away and got one of the Jewish officials to go and approach Jesus on his behalf. And they had to basically point out to Jesus that this centurion over here has a request of you. And so he went back and forth. And basically it was because the centurion felt unworthy to go directly to Jesus. It's not that he was somehow unwilling to go and approach one of the Jewish leaders or Jesus. But rather he simply felt unworthy to go before him. He recognized in Christ an authority that was far above what he had. And that is the very theme of this particular story, is all about the authority of Christ. In fact, if you read through the Gospel of Mark, Mark has an ongoing theme throughout his entire Gospel that talks about the authority of Christ. And one of the reasons that the Jews were so amazed at Christ is that unlike the other Jewish rabbis or Jewish leaders, he did not simply repeat what he had been taught from somewhere else. He didn't just give the same old story, so to speak. Jesus taught as one who himself had the authority to interpret what Scripture meant. He taught in a way that was far different from anything they'd ever heard before which is why throughout Mark, you see that they continually repeat it. It's like, who is this man? What kind of authority is this? Well, they should have figured it out when they woke Jesus up when he was sleeping in the, the boat and they were in the midst of a storm and they woke him up and said, aren't you afraid that we're going to get swamped here? We're going to sink. And he asked and said, well, don't you have any faith? And at that point, he just stood up and simply commanded the wind and the waves and the rain to stop. Now, you would have thought at that point, they would have figured out that Jesus was no ordinary man. But even then, they did see that what kind of authority does this man have that he can even command the weather and that the wind and the waves obey him? Now, of course, with the power of the Holy Spirit later from Pentecost onward, they figured it out. But at this point, they just didn't get it. They knew Jesus was different. They knew he was special. But it simply escaped their understanding that when they were in the presence of Christ, they were in the presence of God Almighty. And that's what the authority of Christ is all about. Now, Jesus said in this story that we're about to read regarding the Roman centurion that he had a faith that was greater than than all of Israel. In fact, he went on to say the time is going to come when people would sit down, and of course he's speaking of 
all the Gentiles and other people that they would sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feet of God, but that the leadership of Israel, the people who should have had faith, would not be there. Well, this centurion recognized authority. And folks, we need to under we need to understand that the basis of real saving faith begins in recognizing in Christ the authority of Almighty God. So before we continue on, let's read this passage of Scripture. Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 5 and going down through verse 13. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. You see, the centurion, as he's explaining in his response to Christ, said, I understand authority. I'm a centurion. I'm, I'm an officer in the Roman army. You know, all I got to do is I, I give this guy an order to do this or to do that. He said, and they do it. That's what the centurion was saying. It's like, I understand and recognize authority when I see it because I've got authority. He told Jesus, said, and I recognize authority in you. All you have to do is say the word, and I know it'll happen. That's why Jesus didn't look around at the others in there and said, folks, I've not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. Because they wanted signs. They wanted Jesus to prove something. The centurion just said, I don't need any proof. I see authority in you. And I know if you just say the word, it'll happen. Well, folks, that is the beginning of faith. That's why Jesus recognized in the centurion that he had a greater faith than all of Israel because that centurion recognized in him authority. Well, where does this authority come from? What is this authority? Well, it begins with the Word of God. You see, Christ's spoken word had authority. That's why the centurion knew that all Jesus had to do was say the word. You give the order and it will happen. Folks, we need to understand that within the pages of this book that we study is indeed the word of God. It is authority. You know, people argue these days over whether the Bible is right or whether it's it's this or that, you know, is this really the Word of God? How do we know that what's in here is right or wrong? And people are constantly arguing and dickering over that. I knew here several years ago that this happened or was published when I was still in the seminary that some, and I can't think of a better way to describe him than this unbelieving nut, published a version of the Bible that was color-coded. He took the Gospels especially, color-coded all the various sayings of Jesus and the commands and the teachings. If they were color-coded green, then, well, he as a theologian had concluded, well, surely Jesus did say that. And if it was color-coded yellow, it was a 
Well, maybe he said it, maybe he didn't. And you can see, obviously, if it was color-coded red, oh, Jesus definitely didn't say that. Well, my question for that man would have been, what gives you the authority to decide what Jesus said or what he didn't? Folks, for us, the difference is not whether the Bible is right or wrong or whether people agree with it or not. You know, we as Christians sometimes when we're discussing the Word of God with people or we're sharing Christ with someone, folks, don't ever let someone get you sidetracked into whether the Bible is right or true. And I'm sure we've all heard, oh, the Bible's full of all kinds of mistakes. I'm not even going to get into that today. Just suffice it to say that if you ask someone to show me one of those mistakes, in all probability, they haven't got a clue. It's just something where they've been told there were mistakes. Folks, it does not matter whether a person believes the Bible is true or not. What matters is that the Bible is true. It is the Word of God. And when God speaks, people can ignore it at their, you know, at their own risk. But when God has placed His message, His Word, His authority into the pages of this book, it's irrelevant whether they believe it or not. It does not detract from the authority that is had within the Word of God. In the same sense that I can tell you today that I don't believe in electricity. I think electricity is just one of those conspiracies that has been cooked up by the establishment. And I don't believe today if I stick my finger in one of these sockets around here, it's not going to do a thing because, well, we just know electricity is really just all a big, you know, joke on humanity. Well, folks, we all know I can deny it all day long, but we also know what's going to happen when I stick my finger in the socket. Folks, people are taking a chance of sticking their fingers into a socket with a lot more power to it than electricity when they deny the authority of the written Word of God. And this written Word reveals to us the living Word. Christ is the declaration, the manifestation, if you want to use a, you know, a theological term for it, the manifestation of God's will and His authority. If you want to know God, you don't have to go hunting for Him out there somewhere. Folks, that's one of the reasons why when Andrew asked Christ to show them the Father, Jesus kind of looked at him puzzled and said, or rather Philip, do you not get it? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. If you want to know God, if you want to know His authority, if you want to know about God, all you have to do is look no further than Christ. He is the very declaration of God's will for us. Well, within the authority, this is what the centurion understood. Not only was there authority in the word of Christ, but he knew there was power backing it up. You know, it's one thing, and I'm sure many of us have found ourselves in a position like this before when, you know, the boss tells you to go do something, and he gives you the authority to do whatever it is the boss wants you to do, but then he doesn't give you the resources to make it happen. Folks, that's one of the things that we need to thank God for, that when God calls us to a ministry, He not only has given us the authority to accomplish that, but He has filled us with the power of the Holy Spirit to back it up. This centurion knew that behind the Word of Jesus was an infinite power and might that all Jesus had to do was say the Word, give the order, and the centurion knew it was going to happen because he recognized in Jesus not only the authority, but the power of God behind it. You know, back during the latter part of World War II and in the years following that, 
well up into the 60s, when many nations, including ours, were experimenting with atomic bombs. Well, then they invented the hydrogen bomb, or the H-bomb, as they like to call it. The most devastating, powerful bomb ever devised by humanity. People were absolutely astounded at the might of an atomic explosion, or I should say a fusion explosion from a hydrogen bomb. By the way, if you're not familiar with them, there's actually two explosions that actually take place in a hydrogen bomb. First off is an atomic fission explosion, and in just a millisecond after that is then a fusion explosion that happens almost simultaneously with it. Folks, the God that we worship would laugh at the power of a hydrogen bomb. Imagine the universe that God has created. Our own sun, for example, is not just one fusion explosion, but billions upon billions that all occur simultaneously and one right after another within the core of our sun. And within our sun is only an example of one of who knows how many billions of stars that God has created. Because that's the kind of power that God has. God is the creator of life itself. When God in Genesis chapter 1 said, let there be, imagine the overwhelming power and authority that occurred each time Christ said, let there be. God created light. He created the earth and the heavens. He created life itself multiple times over the course of those days of creation. That's what that centurion recognized in Christ. Overwhelming, infinite power and authority. Folks, when we recognize in Christ that kind of authority and the authority to utilize and command that kind of power, it should not surprise us that Jesus looked around at those following him and said, Folks, there's nobody in all of Israel that has this man's faith. That's what that ought to, in, to instill in us. An overwhelming faith in who and what God is. Well, what is that faith? First off, well, it begins with our belief in God. That's what the centurion has. The centurion, I believe today, knew that Jesus was no ordinary man. He recognized in him a creative authority that only could be wielded by God himself. If you're going to believe in Christ, we need to begin by accepting who and what Jesus is. Jesus is God Almighty. And to acknowledge God's infinite power. You know, there are people in this world who claim to believe in Jesus. They may even call Him Christ. But folks, until you are willing to believe in the Jesus of this book right here, who is the Son of God, God incarnate, who came, died on the cross, and then through the power of God, rose again from the dead and is alive today, seated on His throne. You can call Jesus by whatever name you want, but the Jesus you believe in, if He is not the God incarnate who died on the cross and rose again, then you're not worshiping the Jesus that I know. This reveals to us, this book we call the Bible reveals to us the true God. That's who we need to be believing in. But it's not just enough to acknowledge that 
He exists. Because keep in mind, the Bible tells us that even the demons believe. But demons don't have saving faith. The demons know who Jesus is. They've met Him before. They were created by Him just as we were. They weren't demons at the time, but you understand the point. They know who Jesus is. They know He's got that kind of authority. That's why, for example, in the story where Jesus encountered the demon-possessed man who he asked, like, what is your name? And of course, he wasn't speaking to the demon-possessed man. He was speaking past him to the demon horde that possessed him. He says, what's your name? Our name is Legion, because there's a lot of us. And then they begged Jesus not to simply cast them out, but let us go into that herd of pigs that's over there. Jesus allowed them to do that. Why? Because they knew he had that kind of authority. See, just believing in Christ is not enough. You've also got to put your trust in Christ. Our trust needs to be in God. God incarnate. We call Him Jesus. We need to place our lives in God's hands. You know, most if not all of us in here have gotten onto a plane at some point in our lives and taken a flight somewhere. You ever really thought about it that when you're on a plane, you are literally placing your life into the hands of the pilot and the co-pilot. You've never probably ever met them before. You have no idea who they are. And yet you're willing to put your life in their hands that they know what they're doing. And yet the God who we claim to believe in, who we say we have a relationship with, so often we're not willing to trust Him. God says, go here and do this. And the first thing out of our mouth is, well, I don't know why. Like, what's in it for me? Why should I do that? Jesus should never have to answer that question. Now, God allows us to ask Him questions. We are allowed, according to the Bible, we can ask God why. But we also need to be prepared that God may say, because I said so. And whether He says yes, no, maybe, or otherwise, or gives us an explanation, or says just trust me, then guess what, folks? We need to trust Him. If we're willing to trust Him, and a pilot that we've never met. You ought to be willing to trust in Jesus. I'm sure probably a lot of us in here have seen the dumper stickers that used to be common a, you know, a few years back that said, God is my co-pilot. Then I remember seeing one not too many years after that that said, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. Good advice. God needs to be the one in charge. We need to trust Christ. If we genuinely have saving faith and we believe in Jesus, then we need to trust in Jesus. That's salvation. And it's an expectation of action by God. You know, when the centurion asked Jesus to heal his servant, said, no, 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 wait a minute. You don't need to come to my house. I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm unimportant. You're God Almighty. I'm not important enough for you to come to my house. I know all you've got to do is say the word. But you'll notice when the centurion told Jesus that, there was an implied. I mean, the centurion didn't have to say it. Jesus knew it. Everybody else knew it. That there was an expectation on the part of the centurion that... If Jesus said the word, if he, if the centurion asked Jesus, then God was going to take action. All Jesus had to do was say the word, and it would happen. Folks, when we say we trust Christ, we need to have an expectation that God's going to answer. So often we pray today. We ask God to heal this person, or do this, or open this door, or direct us here. But then we don't follow up with an expectation that God's actually going to answer. We ask God to heal someone. And then when He actually does it, we act surprised. Folks, if God heals and answers our prayers, it ought not to surprise us. If anything, it ought to surprise us when nothing happens and we need to go back to square one and realize, well, 
Maybe God's answer was not yet or I've got something else in mind. But when God answers our prayers, we ought not to act surprised. If you pray for rain, folks, you better have your umbrella with you. We need to have an expectation of action by God. And like the centurion who then turned and went back home, you know, the Bible tells us that his servant was healed that same hour. Well, how do we know that? Because obviously the centurion went back and found that he'd been healed. We need to put action to our belief. That's the final part of actually having saving faith. Not only believing in God, trusting in God, but then to put that trust into action. When God says, believe me, trust me, and i got something I want you to do, we need to do what God tells us to do. Our response to God needs to be one of trust. To accept Christ's claim and control over us. And when we say, Lord, we accept your gift of eternal life, you know, we so often we tell people, oh, salvation's free. It doesn't cost you a dime. Well, first off, we need to keep, keep in mind salvation was not and never will be free. We didn't have to pay the price, but folks, it was not free. That's why Jesus died on the cross. But it does have a cost for us. That's why Jesus told us that if you're going to be a true disciple, you need to count the cost. Well, he wasn't saying that we need to die for our sins. Folks, that's already been done. Jesus took care of that part for us. But what Jesus does expect of us is that if we're going to accept his gift of eternal life, we're going to follow up by being obedient to him. By putting our faith into action. Just like being in the military, you know, when you go and sign on the dotted line and then raise your hand and swear allegiance to the flag and the Constitution, you don't just then say, well, thank you very much. You know, here's my bank account information. Just send me the check in the mail. I'll be at home. No. We all know what happens after that. You get sent off to basic training. You have an assignment. You're expected to actually do something. You have to earn that paycheck. The military basically exerts its ownership over you. I've even been told that one of the reasons that the term GI got popular back during World War II is because it meant government issue. You as an individual literally became a government issue. Because the government owned you. Well, guess what, folks? When we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, God owns us. He has paid for us by the death of His Son on the cross. We need to accept Christ's claim of ownership over us and to seek out a relationship with Christ, to get to know Him more, to respond to God by being obedient. And that's then the last part of it. What is our obedience to God? We need to obey God's commandments. To recognize that God has a calling and a will for us. You know, the Bible tells us that God's basically got a plan for our life that He already had mapped out before we were ever born. Even before He created us, God already had a plan for us. The question for us is, if we're going to express our faith in Christ, if we're genuinely going to accept His gift of eternal life, is are we going to respond by being obedient to what God has called us to do. Jesus was obedient to the will of His Father. We have eternal life today because Jesus was obedient. I'm pretty sure that it's not too much to ask and that God has a reasonable expectation for us to be obedient to Him. I'll finish with this. Folks, the beginning of faith, the basis of it, is recognizing the authority of God in Christ. And we need to respond by putting our faith completely in Christ to recognize the authority of God that is in Him 
to put our faith in him and then being faithful to his calling and will for us right up until the time we stand before his throne and Jesus calls us to account. My prayer for all of us is that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and Jesus will say, well done. But stand as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you for the many blessings that you give us. We thank you, Lord, for the shed blood of Christ and for his obedience all the way to the cross. Lord, we recognize in you the all authority. Your word has said that all authority is in Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have delegated that authority to us to allow us the privilege of being a part of what you're doing, even right here in this community. Lord, I pray that you'll fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with boldness and with the, the desire, Lord, to share Christ with those around us. And through it all, Lord, may your will be done. In the name of Jesus, glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I ask you to turn in your hymn books to hymn number 437. We sing, wherever he leads, I'll go. That's the question today, is wherever he leads, will we go? Hymn number 437, we sing all four verses, wherever he leads, I'll go.
Thank you for this time. Did God just be the 